Hello? Ho, the things that you've lied about, even pertaining to your mom, you don't want them out, okay? Now, since you think it's funny to speak about people's families, we'll all join in. <laughs> Welcome to my beginning of year BL wrap up. All the BL I watched in January and February. My opinions, my ratings, how I feel, if I recommend them. All the good stuff. Let's just get right into it. I started off the year with I became the main role of a BL drama. This is a rom-com about two actors, cast as the main leads in a series adaptation of a popular manga. They end up moving in together, for work of course, only for work, and they fall in love as they make this BL. It's a bit meta, we're watching a BL, about a BL. It's really interesting actually, it's playing on common romance tropes, you know, forced proximity, secret crush, misunderstandings causing a sort of hate to love situation. It's done in a really fun sweet way, it's tropey in a way that can come off as fanficy and try hard if it were another show. But because that's the entire point and concept of the series, it works wonderfully. I love a silly and loser couple, they're so great. I will say, Akafuji teeters on two levels of obsession, no nothing compares to the main freakazoid sorry, let me take that back. Akafuji just does a few, slightly overboard fanboy things, but I love him, so it's fine. Yeah this show is good, I can't believe I almost DNF'd. I tried to watch episode 1 when it first dropped, and I was so bored and uninterested, I stopped halfway, and waited until I was in the mood to continue. Sometimes the right timing is everything, I randomly had a desire to watch a few weeks later, and binge all 3 eps in one sitting, it's really good, I don't know what was wrong with me. When I see a 2 moons 2 boy leading a show, it's usually a bad omen. Star in my mind. Hidden agenda. That show Earth was in. I don't even remember what that was called man. All I remember is the Taco Bell sponsorship. Cause I was like, huh, that's a new one. I don't like any of those shows. And I had a feeling Pit Babe would be another to add to the list. Pit Babe is about a racer with special abilities named Babe. And a nerdy innocent boy young hot nerd naive young man Charlie. Charlie wants to borrow one of Babe's cars. Babe proposes a deal. They enter a friends with benefits, without the friends, relationship, but of course, they become closer and eventually fall for each other. Alongside other antics, because we're in a megaverse, I didn't know that before I watched, imagine my shock. The second I saw Babe gagging and complaining about Alpha Stench, I knew, I knew we were in a megaverse, I had to pause and do a deep dive into the novel, I always end up spoiling myself, I don't like being caught off guard like that. The racer concept was ruined by love in the air for me, that combined with my feelings towards two moons two alumni shows, and a megaverse, I had a bad feeling. Now after finishing Pit Babe, I don't think this show is horrible. I just don't think it's very good either, I didn't care about the main romance, and if I don't care about the romance, I'm not gonna care about the BL, because that's the whole reason you're watching the show. Nothing about Babe or Shelly was that interesting to me, so nothing about them together was interesting to me either. I liked Alan and Jeff, but I didn't love them. They're an example of me liking a side couple more, but if they were the main leads, I probably wouldn't like them as much as I did. There wasn't enough to their characters. To be fair, there isn't enough to Babe and Charlie either, but that's why I don't care for them. If you made Alan and Jeff, as they are, main leads, I would get bored of them too because there isn't enough in these couples to warrant 13 episodes centering them. I forgot about all the couples and the show as soon as I finished the finale. It's not the type of series I'll think about, or want to revisit. I watched it, it was fine. Moving on. Pit Babe is yet another example of not knowing how to handle an ensemble. There are too many characters for no reason. If you don't have the time to flesh out this many characters, don't have this many characters. My favorite thing was seeing Nut act again. I love that man. He was by far the best actor in here. I wish his character was better. Because I actually think he's fascinating. More than any other character. He does some awful things so I don't like him. But as a character he had so much potential. He could have been a really entertaining piece in the story. But he ended up being a confusing unclear person. 
He is the biggest example of this show's problem with storytelling. This happens. That happens. No in between. No explanation. No effort put into the writing and development. The show is so fast paced, it took me a while to get through all the eps because I was bored. But the story itself goes by so fast, to the point that nothing makes sense. Nothing will happen for a while, then everything happens. We jump from scene to scene with no explanation. Pit Babe overall is not well written or thought out, I see why people like it. Everyone has chemistry, the acting is better than I expected, it's watchable. I wouldn't recommend, but I also wouldn't not recommend, if the summary intrigues you, give it a go. If you like Cutie Pie, Kin Porsche, Love in the Air, Bed Friend, any of those popular shows I don't like, watch it, you'll probably like it. If you don't like those shows very much, and your taste is more aligned with mine, I don't think you're gonna get much out of it. Still try it out if you're bored, it's fine. Again, I don't hate Pit Babe, I also don't think it's very good. I wrote Beyond Cloud off after hating Kin Porsche. I had no intentions of watching DFF. I didn't even know this was a thing until around ep 7, when two mutuals tweeted about it. My circle wasn't tuning in I guess. Maybe you weren't living life to the fullest. Maybe you all were onto something. Dead Friend Forever is good. Well, for the most part. Dead Friend Forever is about 8 school friends, who take a trip out to the middle of nowhere. It's supposed to be a send off to Jin who is about to study abroad. Among the group are P, Tan, and White, newer to the friend group, who are asking questions, curious and eager to learn about the shared memories of the other six. During this, they stumble upon a short film featuring a mysterious ninth boy. Everyone's acting weird. No one wants to talk about him. P and Tan somehow convince the group to recreate the film, leading to unforeseen chaos and tragedy. I mean people are dying. We are tweaking out, as their time at the house unfolds. Questions arise, is the mysterious ninth boy haunting them, or is there someone among them with a sinister agenda to harm their friends? A thriller mystery needs to do a lot more for me to like it, unlike a light-hearted romcom, where I might overlook some flaws, I need strong writing and coherent yet surprising plot twists, sorry, but I didn't have faith in Beyond Cloud to meet my expectations, but at the same time, I'll always trust Thailand to deliver horror the best to ever do it, so I went into the FF anticipating at least some level of enjoyment, and I was right, I genuinely enjoyed most things about the FF, I was shocked by how shocked I was at some parts, it got me, I wasn't able to predict what was gonna happen. The ending of episode 6, I was gagged, some of the reveals and plot twists make me think the FF is genius, then I calm down and remember the parts that knocked the series down a few stars. The entire point of the BL genre is the romance. It's understandable why the, there's no plot criticisms, bothersome viewers, as the love story essentially is the plot. Personally, I need more, I prefer more depth, but ultimately, I am watching for the romance. DFF is an interesting case actually. Surprisingly, none of the relationships in the series resonate with me. In fact, I find them extremely unlikable. I loved P and Non at first, but P pissed me off at the end of Ep 7, and it's been a downward spiral ever since. I hate P and Jin. But here's the thing, I can't deny their chemistry, and the entertainment value they bring to the story. It's awful and I hate them together so much. They're scary shite. It adds to the thriller genre I guess. T and White are cute. But, well, T. I find a character like T intriguing. Fuck him. He gets everything he deserves in the end. Yet, as a character, he captivates me. I admire the skillful way the writers navigated his storyline. They could have taken the easy route, depicting him as a stereotypical bully whose actions are excused by his difficult circumstances. I was fully expecting a redemption arc. Beyond Cloud I owe you an apology. I wasn't familiar with your game. The writer successfully depicted the complexities of human nature, providing insight into T's motivations, without absolving him of responsibility. It's the same aspect of DFF that I both appreciate and find unsettling, which contributes to my mixed feelings about the show. Depicting something and condoning something are two completely different things. There are numerous disturbing elements in this series that left me feeling queasy after each episode. Crew Ken. Lord, take everyone in the universe's pain and suffering and give it to this man. He is a groomer. His manipulation and exploitation is horrifying. While I don't believe the show glorifies his actions, one could argue either way. Maybe this ambiguity itself means it could have been handled more effectively. 
They include students saying disgusting comments about the issue. They're high school boys. But it's not something the show fundamentally believes in. Poor Outright says this in Ep 11, indicating the show's recognition of the grooming, and its attempt to convey this message. The writers even said he's a p***o in a discussion about the series. But did the series itself do enough to conclude the plotline? While you can feature controversial plots in a series if they serve a purpose, the show doesn't do enough to condemn Kang's actions. The lack of explicit condemnation leaves room for misinterpretation. You don't have to spoon feed viewers. I got it. Most people got it. There's a certain corner of watchers that aren't very bright that didn't. They're right alongside the nasty students. Calling this cheating and victim blaming. Is that because the show delivered the plot line poorly? Or is the blame solely on the viewers that don't get what's really going on? The overall portrayal of Non and his abuse. This poor boy has been through so much. I literally feel like I'm about to throw up whenever he's on screen. Because I feel so horrible. And I know that's the point. This discomfort serves a purpose in highlighting the harsh realities of Non's life. But there comes a point where I'm like, enough's enough. It's almost sensationalizing Non's trauma. It's just so much. With every episode the show just adds things in to upset the viewer. It ends up feeling more like a shock tactic than a genuine exploration of Non's character. Non's identity as a victim dominates the narrative, overshadowing any opportunity for character development beyond his suffering. The excessive graphic content could have been toned down or implied to convey the same message effectively. I don't know cuz I get why it is the way it is. It's just, sometimes horror leans excessively on gore and violence for my taste. DFF ended up feeling like it was trying too hard to be complicated twisted and scary. Sometimes focusing on genuine suspense and build up is more impactful. Sometimes they really nailed the attention to detail, or at least exceeded my expectations. For instance, all the posters in Non's room were horror movies featuring kids. For the most part about said kids dying. You could analyze these movies and their parallels with DFF's storyline. I find things like this so cool, but sometimes they prioritize shocking the viewer over attention to detail, which leads to important details being overlooked. This results in plot holes and leaves us with more questions than answers. These shows have been embarrassing me lately when I praise prematurely. DFF is definitely the kind of show where the ending can make or break it, so I held my thoughts in until it was over. As we got closer to the end, I was having more problems with it. Now that I've seen the whole show, I understand why I didn't hear about DFF until Ep 7. I was only invested from Ep 1 to the first minutes of Ep 7. Even now, weeks later as I write this, I'm still unsure how I feel about the final episode. I like the idea, but there was a better way to do it. It's one of those shows where fan theories seem more compelling than the actual script. Whenever a BL series attempts to stray from the predictable school romance formula, they have the groundwork for a great story, but fail to flesh it out properly. DFF isn't flawless, nor is it one of my top faves, but I found enjoyment in it. The writing overall was much stronger than I anticipated. It's a step in the right direction for Beyond Cloud. Where should I start? This might be the top Korean BL we've seen yet in terms of quality. Personally, it's my number one favorite, alongside our dating sim. I'm in my simulation era. When I started making this video, the show had just started airing. Now it's been weeks since it ended, and it still consumes my thoughts just as much. I love a show that makes me think, and has an ending that can be interpreted in different ways, sparking discussions even after it's over. But it shouldn't feel lazy, like the writers got bored and left it up to the audience to find meaning in it, because that's how DFF Ep 12 kinda fell to me. Love for love's sake was intentional. It feels like how the series was headed from the beginning. My thoughts weren't spinning out of confusion. It was just truly thought-provoking. Speaking of confusion, did any of you find love for love's sake confusing? I saw a handful of reactors and tweets being so confused. Here's the summary before we get into that. The show follows Tame Young Ha, a 29-year-old who finds himself stuck in the body of a 19-year-old high school student within a game called Love for Love's Sake. This game is based on a novel by his senior. Myung Ha is tasked with making the main character, Cha Yo Woon, happy. Yo Woon is Myung Ha's favorite character in the novel, and he feels a strong connection to him. The story explores Myung Ha's efforts to bring happiness to Yo Woon and raises questions about how the game will diverge from the novel and how it will ultimately conclude. 
Makes sense right? Sorry. I don't understand what was so confusing for some people. Maybe pay attention a little more? No let me be objective. If that many people were confused, maybe some things could have been clearer. There were moments that felt disjointed, like there wasn't a smooth transition from one scene to the next, but it didn't affect my enjoyment. Everything still made sense and flowed well. It could have been improved with maybe an extra episode or two. Maybe slightly longer runtime. Even though the episodes are a pretty perfect length. If you're only gonna have 8 episodes, make them a bit longer and utilize every second you have. Love for love's sake accomplished just that. Unlike another KBL this year, which we'll discuss later, every episode surpassed the previous one. While I do believe they could have possibly benefited from one more episode, they didn't need it. The storyline felt comprehensive, and I felt fully satisfied once it was over. This series has already become iconic. There are so many lines and scenes that I'll be quoting and referencing for years. The chemistry. This is the best chemistry a cast has had this year. Everybody, not just the couple at the center. Instantly, you're fully immersed in the relationships of these characters. The acting is incredible. The natural chemistry is there. It's been a while since I've felt so deeply connected to fictional characters. They make you feel everything. It's such a well-crafted show. I don't know what else to say. I don't have many thoughts on this one, I'll be honest, I'm writing the review way after watching and I don't remember much of anything, which is telling, I mean it's a 20 minute short film, which was recently divided into a 3 episode format on Strongberry's YouTube channel. Happy Ending tells the story of Hyun who owns a bookstore, one day he finds his high school diary, he remembers the past, thinking about his one sided love for his childhood friend, Dong Ho, Sung Hyuk, who played milk in Choco Milkshake is a main character here, so that was cool. However, aside from that, it didn't leave much of an impression on me. The story is essentially told through diary entries, a concept that makes for creativity and poetry in the writing. I just wish they had more time to expand on it. Everything is good. I just finished it with a lot of questions. It presents the idea without the payoff, which is interesting in itself, but not really my taste. I would rather have more time to explore everything they presented. I ended up feeling more like I watched a trailer than a finished product. Um, I don't like Jazz for 2. After watching it all, I've been going back and forth trying to decide if it was somewhat okay, or one of the worst things I've ever seen. The more I think about it, the more I lean towards thinking it's very very bad. I knew from the first episode that it wasn't going to be at the top of the KBL pyramid, but I was holding out hope for Hang Yim. You know I'm a fan of Omega X, but I almost had to give up on this. The first episode was probably the best, but it gets worse and worse. Episode 7? That scene in Ep 7 made me so uncomfortable. How can you root for the main couple to be together after that? No, I was done at that point. I liked Do Yoon and Sehun as characters the most. They were the only characters I truly enjoyed. It's not because I only prefer sweet unproblematic characters. Jazz for 2 takes things too far with their romantic interests without any real purpose. The characters are just unpleasant, and they give me no reason to support them. I liked the idea of the brothers and their backstory, but I think if they spent more time showing us their past, it would have been disappointing too. Actually, it already is disappointing. Taejun committed. I don't need to explain why that's serious. I would like to know more about him as a person. But basically, all we know about him is that he's not around anymore. The little bit we do see of Taejun is in the quick backstory with Seijin, but it's not even included for their character's sake. It's only there to create drama between the main couple, and every problem in this show gets resolved without any real depth to it, which is frustrating considering how long the episodes are. The runtime for these episodes isn't much different from Love for Love's Sake, but the difference in quality is so clear. There's so much homophobia in Jazz for 2. Maybe it's realistic, especially in a place like Korea, but that's not why I watch queer media. You can include homophobic plotlines if they serve the narrative, but in Jazz for 2, it just feels unnecessary and uncomfortable. If I had to sum up Jazz for 2 in one word, it would be uncomfortable. Um, so, the part of me that was raised on Wattpad enjoyed Do Yoon and Juha's storyline a little. I think Hang Yeom was the best actor in the show. Maybe that's my forex bias speaking, but he was the standout for me. The rest of the acting was, let's just say hard to watch at times. Anyway Do Yoon and Juha's storyline was the most interesting for me. It was still poorly executed. Whether they end up together or not doesn't matter to me. The series failed to make me invested. However, I did like the trope. There was potential for something more. 
The more I reflect on this series, the more it feels like it should be grouped with Starstruck. Shows that were so terrible they shouldn't have been made. I try to be objective as much as possible, but I really can't think of many positives. I hear the webtoon was better. I hope that's true. It's difficult to imagine it being worse. Let's do a speed run of the shows I'm currently watching. 23.5 is incredible, brimming with energy and positivity. It's the perfect choice for GMM's first GL. Packed with wonderful representation. It's exactly the kind of sweet, romantic, and fluffy show I adore. Eileen and Luna. Oh my god I haven't seen romance like this in a minute. Now it just needs to continue being great. And GMM TV needs to take a hint and make more GL. The possibilities of pairings are endless. Get to it. Love is better the second time around. I watched the first two eps but haven't returned to it yet. I will. But I'm not eager to continue. Do with that what you will. And only boo. I really like it as expected. It's my type of troll goofy cringe mixed with sweet romance and chemistry. I have to do one too many cringe pauses. I like it a lot though so it's okay for now. Just get that fucking filter off GMM TV you're hurting my eyes. Their editors enjoy that beauty blur whitewash brightness up to a thousand way too much lately. What is wrong with you people? Stop it. It doesn't look good. I need to include we are in this now. Really the longer I take to finish this video the more shows are coming out. We only two weeks into this damn thing and I'm ready to give up! I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed We Are's first ep. Winnesetang carried it for me. I wanted their next roles to switch the character types from my school president so bad. We Are is fulfilling that wish, with Saturn playing the sunshine character and Winnie portraying the cool calm one. It reminds me of Fish Upon the Sky. Speaking of, you know I didn't love Never Let Me Go. It made me start to think I didn't like Pond Puwin. But Poom and Peem also brought me back to my futz days. They shine in comedic roles. Generally, GMM TV shows are more enjoyable for me when they focus on more com than rom. Even the direction and color palette of this show stood out to me, surpassing other 2024 GMM TV shows. Again, I owe you an apology. I wasn't familiar with your game. Although I don't know if my interest will hold throughout, especially considering the 16 episode length, I'm cautiously optimistic after the strong first episode, knowing news track record with me. There may be unnecessary conflicts and convoluted plots to fill the episodes, but let's wait and see. Maybe they just need the extra eps to flesh out all the characters. The promising start gives me hope. Well, this year hasn't been great to me so far, and the BL I've been watching haven't helped much either. Only love for love's sake has made me feel that feeling. That 6 out of 5 star feeling that I'm always looking for. How has 2024's BL been for you so far? Are you enjoying them? Are you hating them? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments. Please read through the links in my description. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in my next video. Bye my loves.